General Rainey, thanks so much for being here. Uh, you know, I think most of our audience is familiar with you as the Commanding General for Army Futures Command. So really appreciative of you taking some time to sit down and talk about uh, the present and future of what's going to happen with AI and national security. Yeah, well, thank you for asking me. Maybe the first question is, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, based on your time uh, at Army Futures Command, uh, how new AI advancements, especially ones over the past year, uh, such as ChatGPT and large language models and Donovan, can aid commanders in their decision making. Yeah. So, um, and and for the audience, you know, I'm I'm not a, a, a technical uh, expert, but I am a very experienced commander um, with a lot of uh, repetitions and a lot of time doing this. I think the real fascinating potential is the ability to aid commander's decision making. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, I hope, nobody hopes there's not a war more than the people that fight it, you know, so I, I hope this is about deterring conflict and that's a real opportunity we can talk about <clears throat> um, with technology. But when we do fight, it, it really, the way the United States military fights is, is very commander centric. So the ability of our commanders to make more decisions, better decisions, and faster decisions provides a thing called uh, decision advantage. Um, I personally think things like AI, large language models, your, your products and others could move past decision advantage into uh, uncharted thing called decision dominance. You know, I mean, the combination of how talented our humans are and how good we are with technology uh, could really provide a game-changing uh, capability that no other country would be able to match. So commanders making more, better, faster decisions. <clears throat> and this is really important because the United States military uh, is a values-based, you know, we, we subscribe to the law of armed conflict, unlike some of our enemies. <clears throat> and that's, that's a good thing. That's why we're, you know, that's why we're better, right? And if we didn't do that, there'd be no point. You know, so the, the, I say that to say that allowing commanders the time to ethically prosecute, you, know, you, you need to not be a little bit faster than the person you're fighting. You have to be 10x because we're gonna need time to practice ethical decision-making and, and prevent, you know, we care deeply about the loss of civilian life and unnecessary collateral damage. So, so the opportunities of technology to come to bear to aid the commander, not replace them. Yeah, and I think you touched on a topic that I think is incredibly important, um, which is the idea of deterrence. You know, we're building this technologies primarily to deter conflict. Right. Um, you know, the way that I like to talk about it is, is we need to build AI deterrence. It's not about, um, you know, there are bad people out there and there's state and non-state actors who uh, are gonna wanna use AI for, for not great things or are gonna wanna use technology writ large for not great things. And uh, the, the point of our capability development and the point of our strength as a country is to, is to ultimately deter this conflict. Yeah, absolutely. You know, will, will AI be a net force for good or force for evil? I mean, that's very much an issue. One, it, it's not a reason to not pursue it. I mean, bad actors are gonna so the good actors have to outcompete the bad actors, and there's there's other examples throughout history. You know, um, you know, any pick any weapon, it has a potential to do good, and a potential to do bad, and it really comes down to the people who handle it. So I'm glad to be an American in that space. I, I will say that uh, <clears throat> I I believe the United States has a dramatic advantage when it comes to technology and you pick pick a, a a competitor or you know somebody who wishes us ill um there's nobody that can do what we can do you know the combination of our innovative spirit um entrepreneurial approach to life the academic excellence the the just just it sounds kind of corny but just being free you know living right. in a free country where you have opportunities that don't exist in controlled, closed societies. Um, 
the the fiscal strength and and venture capitalistic type approach when used for good is a superpower so the nexus of all those things i think we have a marked advantage in sustaining that it's very very important because i think that does deter our 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 most advanced enemies very much right yeah and i think i think that's demonstrated by ai you know ai you know, a, a lot of the innovation in large language models, the transformers, the original large language models were all developed and built in the United States. Yeah. It's a testament to all the things that you mentioned, you know, the innovative environment, uh, entrepreneurship, which I think enabled this to, to get to scale much faster and, and to, to really uh, be deployed very quickly, as well as, you know, the, our values, you know, having a free society. You know, large language models like ChatGPT are pseudo banned in China because they have to adhere to socialist principles, which is very hard for any large language model to do. Yeah. Um, so uh, definitely agree with you on all these fronts. So General Rainey, what do you think we need to be doing with AI, specifically when we think about the army, um, to be able to operate in a complex, highly contested space against high-end adversaries, uh, like some of the the technologically very advanced adversaries that we see today. Yeah. Um, again, not, <laughs> not being an expert at, at the technical aspects of it. Um, I, the biggest thing, Alex, to be honest with you, is I, I feel like we need to translate theoretical and possible into genuine capability in our formations. So there are a lot of things we think we can do. There's things we know we can do. There's things you and other great companies like yours have indisputably proven can be done, um, but they're not they're not integrated into our Army, Air Force, Navy. You know, they're not a capability that a commander has if he or she were to end up in conflict this weekend. So closing that delivery uh, window and and operating at the speed of relevance in terms of inventing something, turning it into a capability, learning. And you know, as I've studied you know, your industry, it, it's really the, I, the way, the way uh, you all approach a min viable product. You know, it, hey, if, it's, if it's good enough, get it out there. You know, three years later, you're gonna be embarrassed by what you put out this year. You know, you know what I mean? Like that kind of culture that you have, but until we start using it, you're not going to realize the potential. I spend a lot of time, and they're all, li listen, there's no bad people in the process, you know, it's, it's just a giant bureaucracy that, that is hard to drive change, but, but uh, you know, we, we can't take five years, ten years, we can't have programs of record. You know, that, that makes sense if you're building a new helicopter, a new tank, but that is not the way to approach technology. So. Um, it starts with uh, writing better requirements, which is my, you know, I'm, I'm accountable for that for the Army. Um, we got to quit asking you for specific things and ask you for a cape, you know, the better I can right. do describing the capability I want uh, and less prescriptive, the better product we get back. Right. Um, we have great acquisition people and we have all the acquisition authorities we need, but we need to innovate in how we do acquisition just like we're innovating in technology. Um, <clears throat> we have great contracting folks that can put things on contract. Uh, they've demonstrated, you know, if you look at Ukraine, you know, if, if we want to go fast in contracting, we can go fast. So we got to think about that. You know, do we have enough contractors? Are they in the right place to go at the speed of relevance? I think testing and evaluation when it comes to software and technology is ripe for innovation. Um, we, we shouldn't test a UAV to the same standards that we test a manned helicopter. You know, why do we test software? You know, there, I mean, like, there's probably a make sure it does what we're paying you to do kind of testing, but it doesn't need to fall into this right. life limb and eyesight type, you know, it's not going to hurt anybody. Uh, I mean, I guess it could technically, but you know, it's, it, it, it's, we have to innovate in the test and evaluation space. And, yeah. um, I, I think the real potential in bringing companies together that optimizes the best, you know, we don't, we don't, we, the army, we, the government don't want to have to pick between a great company like yours 
and two or three other ones. We got to figure out how to build consortiums that optimize the best. You know, you guys can compete in the commercial sector. That's your business. But but can we, in the interest of national security, bring you guys in a way that's right. profitable and sustainable, but but optimizes the best of all these great American companies? Right. So that's a. You know, that's, a, that's a lot and that's a big you know it takes a big healthy dose of optimism every day but but I believe we can do that yeah and and notably I think that's the blueprint you know if you think about our adversaries that have their strengths but also their weaknesses you know being able to do all the things that you mentioned but bring together a lot of the innovation that's yeah. happening um, here in the West and here in the United States to combine and 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 you know to your to your point on consortiums like bring it all together to build exquisite new capabilities and translate that to capabilities, I mean, that's the, that's the key. At a, at a speed that is dramatically faster than we're moving now. Yeah. Not in the innovation, but in the deliver, translation of cap, innovation into capability. Yeah, and definitely, I mean, that's where, um, I mean, we spent a bunch of time on this today, but that's, uh, and this is what you spend every day thinking about uh, in Futures Command, but um, thinking about how we can take cool technology that we, we and others have developed um, and, and figure out the path from that technology to, to deployment, to real capability, real deterrence, as we mentioned. That's, that's your specialty and that's what we, we were talking about. Well, fortunately I have phenomenal men and women working with me to help me do that. But yeah, there's some big unifying ideas. I mean, uh, a truly data-centric approach to command and control in warfighting um, is a leap ahead. Uh, coupled with all the great work that's going on left to right to fix things now, I, I, I think there's a, a really big idea. Data-centric warfare, algorithmic warfare, um, you know, the, the idea that if, if data was in a state that was accessible and usable, and, and then instead of trying to connect disparate things, you had a central place where data was in a position or in a state that would allow you to apply AI largely, you know, all the potential in the things that you're doing, you know, if quantum becomes a thing, whatever, none of it is gonna be able to be employed to its fullest effect unless the data is accessible and usable. Yep. And that also solves all kinds of interoperability problems. It dramatically increases your speed, um, the ability to integrate partners, which are big part of how we how we operate all those problems kind of go away if you if you manage that so that's one um, and I and related to that I, I believe uh, autonomy is not going to replace humans so the, the person the people the, the country the military that figures out how to optimize humans and machines together you know, what's the, what's, how do you take humans and machines, put them together in a way that offloads risk and work onto machines, but more importantly, optimizes your humans to do the things that only humans can do. Intuition, curiosity, ethical decision-making, the art, you know, our, my profession is some, like everyone probably, but the military profession is some combination of art and science. So the more science I can do by machines that are better at it, the more art I can do that only the human can do. So those two big ideas, I think, is, is, is the people that are thinking past the next couple of years, um, one, I think they're the future, and two, they're huge opportunities to get better. Yeah, and, and I think you bring up a bunch of very critical points. I mean, one, and something that, that we certainly believe, which is that data centricity and data is the, the foundation upon which all of these exciting concepts and all these exciting capabilities are going to be able to be built on top of. Um, you and I both know the, the work that the, the department has to do on, on its data, um, but you know if we do that work now, then we set up a foundation upon which for decades and decades, I think we'll be able to maintain capability advantage. Yes. Um, and then I think the other piece that you brought up is, is equally important, which is the human-machine collaboration. Um, you know, the way that, at least when we look at AI, the way, and, and the way that technology in general goes, you know, we will definitely develop, uh, whether it's AI or robots or drones or whatnot, um, we'll develop, uh, you know, machines that are in some ways vastly superhuman, you know, way better than humans at, in some areas. 
Um, and we've done this consistently. Steam engines are, you know, don't, don't get as tired as humans um, when doing tons and tons of, uh, of manual work. Um, you know, these AI systems are already, you know, they don't make grammar mistakes where humans make grammar mistakes. They, they are able to stick a lot, they're able to remember a lot more information than we are. But to your point, there's always gonna be areas that humans are dramatically better and, and will be, um, we'll need to harness the human capability in tandem with the machine capability to, be, and to, you know, also to your point, offload risk more so than than automate, right? You know, it's it's more about, you know, how do we reduce the human toll of warfare, reduce the human risk, the risk towards you know lives of of great Americans um, more so than than anything else. So, I uh, I appreciate your vision on that quite a bit. I think each of those components, if we get them right, are going to be. Um, are going to be absolutely critical. Yeah, and I, I think that that's why, like, I have a pet peeve. Like, I, I, I don't like the word human machine teaming, but that's kind of in vogue. I, I, I deliberately use the term integration, human machine integration, because teams are groups of humans. You know what I mean? Like, you value your teammates, you're willing to sacrifice for your, like, that's the whole exact opposite of a robot, right? You know, hey, this is going to be really dangerous. Let's try it with the robot before we, you know, risk right. blood and you know our most precious. No matter what we invent, the most precious system in the United States Army, the most valuable is always going to be a human, right? Yep. Um, you know, the the rifle squad in the Army is nine human beings, and nobody's ever going to invent anything that is better than nine brains and nine hearts, right? Yep. The care, but uh, but. It's not a team. It's integrating. It's optimizing the two for the the, the best combination of uh, the best division of labor and risk. Yep. Um, you know, you mentioned the the Ukraine war, which I think has has demonstrated in some ways that c conflict is totally changed. You know, when it comes to drone drone warfare and some of the advanced technologies that are being used. But in other ways, I think demonstrates um, a conflict that seems, you know. Uh, in some ways, like a, almost like a World War One style conflict. You know, there's yeah. a lot of trench warfare. There's a high human toll. You know, it's very, very human intensive. What are What are some of your takeaways from how the the Ukraine war has has developed? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you framed it that way. Most people are taught or learned that there's an industrial age, and you know, it's usually got a date and a date, and then there was a information age. Some people say data, some people say information, then, you know, but, but when you get this in a classroom, you know, you went to better schools than I did, but most people, uh, it's kind of linear, right? What, what you're, the biggest observation from Ukraine, and I think now in Gaza, tragically, uh, is that there's not a break. You know, it's, it's the industrial age warfare is very real and relevant, you know, high explosive artillery is killing, you know, it doesn't make it on Twitter. It's not as sexy as a quadcopter dropping a grenade in the hatch of a tank. But the thing that is killing people is old fashioned high explosive artillery. So the industrial age is continuing to run, but there is absolutely, you know, a phenomenal disruption in terms of data and technology that's happening. So it's not binary, it's, it's both. The first is important because uh, the most important thing in warfare is still human beings. It's ultimately a contest of wills and, you know, pick a conflict, you see that ultimately it's whose people are gonna fight and stay in the fight and for what purpose. And, uh, <clears throat> and that land warfare, despite, you know, space, cyber, the exponential explosion in that space, precision weapons, um, everything still come, every capability we have is dependent on controlling the land. So those kind of industrial concepts are not going to... So when I talk about the future, I usually start with what's not going to change. You know, people are going to stay primary. The land's always going to matter. We're a values-based military, and we're going to follow the law of armed conflict. So, so view those. But that's not as interesting as what is happening. So the, the craziness is uh, a technological disruption that's... You know, some people say unprecedented. It, indisputably, the last time things were this crazy was like the lead up to World War II. You know, when things were this uncertain, 
people were inventing things like combustible engines, airplanes, and radios. You know yep. what I mean? If you're a student of history, it's crazy. Yep. Um, and that was three things that, ha that disrupted warfare, but we had 30 or 40 years to figure it out, right? That disruption is, is, is happening now, but it's gonna happen again next, you know, it's like every six months, every year. You know, the war in Ukraine has seen like four major evolutions in unmanned aerial systems inside. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah. So nobody's going to figure it out. It's going to be about the ability to learn and adapt faster. So the adaptability is a characteristic and adoption of technology is more important than inventing. So who can see something happen, learn from it, and then translate it into capability. Uh, is is the real challenge, but so uh, uh, w the war the battlefield of now and certainly in the future is going to be uh, swept by an array of sensors that's that's going to make it you know you're, you're going to operate under constant observation of some kind. Um, <clears throat> that coupled with uh, precision guided munitions. And in the case of China, magazine depth, you know, the amount, just the sheer amount of munitions they have is going to confront our commanders in, you know, with air, sea, maritime, land. Uh, we're going to have to fight by, fight somebody who can see us and can hit us. So the ability to disrupt his ability, you know, so, okay, they can see me, they can hit me. So now the challenge is preventing them from understanding what they're seeing right so counter c5 attacking their command and control system is as important as maintaining ours the uas thing is the leading ed of, edge of a technological disruption of the land domain it's kind of deeper sorry about this but think back 20 years when uavs came on board and what that did to the air domain and the air force and right uh Five, ten years ago, that same disruption started happening in the maritime, you know, com commercially before military, but now unmanned surface and subsurface ships, whether you're talking about offensively or countermine or logistically, that's a thing. The land domain is the last because of the laws of physics, yep. you know. Back to things that probably aren't going to change. I would put the laws of physics in the probably not going to change category, although I, I you know, wouldn't say anything definitively. But uh, so it's just harder. You know, we have rivers, we have hills, we have mud. You know, it's the most difficult place for technology to be employed. But we're absolutely, you know, the kind of things your company's doing, other companies are doing. We, we technology is advanced to the point where it can have that same disruptive effect on the land. And whoever figures that out and brings it to bear first is going to have a dramatic advantage. Right, 100%. And and I think you touched on um, a few key components, which is you know the the sensing capability over the past few decades. I think has just dramatically dramatically improved, which is part of you know ties back to one of the previous things we we're saying. One of the key things is you know you have all the sensing capability. Make sure that your data pipelines are such that. You can make use of that and actually use that to your advantage. But it, it also ties to one thing that um, we've talked about in the past, uh, which is um, you know when you th when we think about command and control systems, you know when when we've talked about um, even earlier in this conversation about the uh, American approach, it's to uh, aid and enhance existing commanders. Whereas um, you know there's there's certainly reports from uh, the PLA and the CCP that talk about how they want to build you know, fully automated command and control systems, and they're trying to use AI to, to take the commander out of the process and out of the loop. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, that dichotomy and that difference. Yeah, um, our, I said our biggest strength in the United States Army, the United States military, is our humans. You know, we're an all-volunteer force. We have a non-commissioned officer corps, empowered sergeants that everybody in the world wishes they had. We have more and better leaders. We put more leaders into a formation than anybody else, and they're better than anybody else's. And then they all bubble up 16 to 20 years later, 30 years later, you have a commander 
who has so much experience and talent and education, those are real advantages. So why would you take that, if you're, the, if you're us, it, why would you take that person out of the process? So it's 100% about optimizing that commander's ability to make decisions. Uh, if you didn't have good people, or you were worried about your people doing what they're told, uh, it would be logical to just wait for the screen to tell them where to go. And that creates all kinds of vulnerabilities that'll work to our advantage, I think. Uh, if I can, just to try and visualize that, if, if you come to a fork in the road, a U.S. commander with the capabilities that we could absolutely do now, I want to know everything there is to know about going left versus going right. Tell me, you know, tell me what the terrain's like. Tell me, you know, in the past, who has done the left and who's done the right and why and how did it work out and, uh, you know, task a million sensors and tell me everything there is to know. When's the last time it rained? What's the speed of the river? Who's down there waiting for me, right? But I'm going to make that decision. Uh, if you're going with the other approach, if you come to that fork in the road and you're able to disrupt that command and control system even a little bit, or better yet, inject some confusion to it, the enemy's going to sit at that fork in the road waiting to be told which way to go. We're probably going to see them waiting and kill them there, but they're certainly going to be slower. Um, our commander is going to come to that road, and, and if the computer tells him, hey, Jim, 97% says you should go left, I would probably say, yeah, if it's that obvious, they're going to expect that, so I'm going to go right. You know, just intuition, instincts, repetition, you know, the art. Um, you can't write code for that, you know what I mean? So I think our approach is much better. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. And I think I think to your point, you know, one way to distill that is the the fully automated systems are they're prone to yeah. you know adversarial attacks, counterattacks, and and manipulation. Uh, and the 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 integrated approach, let's say, is one that that enables us to be nimble and enables us to use our greatest advantage. Commander aided decision. Now that's going to take a bunch, it's not that simple, it's going to take a bunch of education. There are cases where we have, we have some people in the military, in the army, younger people that are both incredibly tech savvy and really good at fighting, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a common overlap. So there's a big part of our leader development and education where we need to take our commanders on this journey with us so that they know how to ask questions in a manner that lets the technical experts leverage what they know. So it's, 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 it's not just as simple as I might have made it sound, you know. Knowing how to ask your staff a question in a way that lets them go into a large language model and deliver it, yep. you know. That, that's my short experience with things like what you're doing is it, it almost comes down to can you ask a good question. Yeah, the adaptability is key. That's kind of as we've I was playing about. around, you know, earlier, like, what didn't I ask you that I should have? That's a good prompt, you know. Get, re, give me a return on that one. That That's kind of exciting to me also. Yeah. Well, General Rainey, thanks so much for, for taking the time, and we covered a lot of ground. Um, to close, I'd love to just ask you, and I think I, I, think I probably know the answer, but, um, you know, what about the potential of artificial intelligence excites you the most, especially based on some of the stuff that you've seen here at scale and you've walked through with our team? I think the ability to deliver a command and control warfighting function that is so daunting to anybody that would, you know, I, I want our enemies to look at us and say, I, I don't want to mess with that. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, because the one thing, if you decide to fight us, uh, you have to be certain that you're going to win, right? Because it's a big, you know, it's a big deal, existential fights with nuclear super, you know, it's not something anybody's going to do lightly. So the opportunity to deter people, and they're already concerned with our tech advantage. They're definitely concerned with our military, traditional military advantages. Um, I, I think the ability to uh, demonstrate excellence in command and control 
maintain the advantage we have in technology uh, is going to put our enemies to bed, you know, one day at a time and, and preserve, you know, prevent a war that I, I feel certain that we would prevail in, but nobody's going to win that kind of war. Uh, the human suffering alone would just is just really tragic if you think about it. So the potential to add AI, add technology into our toolkit that has a deterrent effect over anybody that wishes us ill um, so that, you know, we don't have to fight. Yeah, and this is exactly, I mean, this is totally possible, I think. I mean, I think the, the pace of technological progress in AI in the United States is staggering and I think is, is moving faster than in any other country, anywhere else in the world. And our, um, you know, as I think the U.S. military and U.S. Uh, United States has demonstrated for decades and decades till now, you know, we can, if we have the technology advantage, then that deters conflict globally. Um, and yeah, and, and, and companies like yours and there, there's others, um, you know, are adding a whole new, a whole new layer, you know, so you got you know, big defense traditionalists and you got young startups and there's this whole middle layer of dual use companies that, that you know, can profit and contribute to national defense is, is really exciting. Uh, kind of like the teaming thing. I, I, I don't love the term defense industrial base. I mean, if you look at the history of this country, uh, it, it's really the American industrial base that's our superpower. You know, you go back to World War II those weren't defense primes cranking out, you know, a thousand airplanes a month. And, you know, General Mills was, you know, not a military company, but they're one of the heroes of, of World War II. You know, um, that, that kind of capability exists today with companies like yours and others. So yeah. thanks, for, thanks for your partnership. Thanks for, thanks for caring about the country and the military. Oh, we appreciate it. Thanks again for, for being here and for chatting with us on, uh, on such an important topic. And, uh, you know, we have our work cut out for us. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll do it together. Thank you.